traveling on the Midland bus from Hansburg to Smedic, the slogans was all over the place. The, the walls were daubed with black paint. If you want a nigger for a neighbor, vote Labour. That was the uncompromising slogan used in the 1964 general election campaign at Smethwick. The insults traded at Smethwick are just one chapter in the story of how the political establishment has chosen to deal with the race card. Smethwick is in no way a kind of pariah town, quite unlike anywhere else. It was true everywhere. What it said to most political observers was it was a red-hot issue. Votes were to be won. A lot of people didn't want, as the awful slogan went, a nigger for a neighbour. in general were all in favour of the British Empire as long as it stayed where it was. Uh, they didn't want it here. It was a far cry from the fellowship which all British and Commonwealth subjects had celebrated just years before at the coronation. Will you solemnly promise and swear to govern the peoples of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, the Union of South Africa, Pakistan and Ceylon, and of your possessions and the other territories to any of them belonging or pertaining according to their respective laws and customs? in a way which it's really almost impossible for the present generation to understand. There was this feeling that this was the mother country, the centre of empire, and traditionally there had been a right of free entry to all citizens of the UK and all citizens of the Commonwealth and the colonies. The Prime Ministers of Northern Ireland, of Southern Rhodesia, of Ceylon, Pakistan. They'd always had the right to come here because they were uh, originally called British citizens, wherever they were in the Commonwealth, even if they couldn't speak a word of English. And here they come, Her Majesty's colonial troops at the head of the Great Procession, the men of the Commonwealth nations marching behind them. In both world wars, men from the Commonwealth had fought and died in British uniforms to defend the Empire. But when large numbers of Commonwealth citizens actually began to take up their right to come here, the imperial largesse of the British establishment gradually melted away. I came home in the end from, from, uh, from uh, Pakistan on an anchor line ship. Down the sort of lowest deck was a lot of these immigrant families. And some of these children came out onto the deck squatted and defecated, you know? Well, that's what they did. You know, <laughs> went outside the hut and... Uh, uh, and they, you know, that was the sort of problem we were having to deal with. How on earth people got the money to come here from places like West Africa and, and uh, Barbados and so on? I have no idea. They never seemed to earn anything when they were there and... and uh, most of them, I think, didn't make much effort to earn anything much when they were here, either. Whitehall considered plans to treat members of the Commonwealth as aliens, just like all other nationalities. In other words, people from the Commonwealth would be stripped of their British citizenship. I remember going to see Sir Arthur Hutchinson, the Deputy Secretary, I said that all that was really needed was to give me the same powers about aliens as I had, about British subjects as I had about aliens. And he said, in effect, oh, don't be silly. Uh, he said, you know, it could.
In fact, this question was being addressed by a secret civil service committee throughout the 1950s. It deliberately sought evidence that non-white immigrants had undesirable characteristics to help make the case for controls. Attention is drawn to the incidence of venereal disease among colored people, which is slow mentally, and the speed of work in modern factories is quite They have a disproportionately capacity. large number of convictions for brothel keeping and living on immoral earnings. Meanwhile, the government was under pressure from outside Whitehall. I went to a lunch at Downing Street with Mr. Churchill. It was actually a non-political lunch. This was in February 1955. And he asked me what line the spectator, which I was then running, was taking on the question of immigration. So I said we were uh, calling for some sort of controls because we thought if nothing was done, there would be race riots. Uh, to which he replied, I uh, entirely agree. Uh, I think this is the most important issue facing the country, but I can't get any of my ministers to take any notice. A terminus which for many of us has been the gateway to London, the first city of the Commonwealth. More and more immigrants were coming into Britain every week, and MPs were becoming aware of hostility towards the immigrant communities. I became a uh, member of parliament for Lewisham in, in 1959, and that had been an area in which there'd been big West Indian immigration. One, one part of Lewisham, I remember, uh, Ladywell, really seemed to change in the matter of a few years from being overwhelmingly white uh, to being predominantly black. The way in which a familiar street you know, suddenly looked totally alien uh, was, for lots of people, just utterly confusing. By 1961, the arrival of some 3,000 immigrants a week spurred ministers to act. It was the sheer numbers that finally tipped the scales in favour of, of legislating. Once we realised the scale in which it was developing, I think even those like Webb and me and others who desperately wanted to avoid it believed we had to have it. It fell to Home Secretary Rab Butler to bring in a law which would take away the automatic right of British subjects from the Commonwealth to come to Britain. We shall decide on a basis absolutely regardless of colour and without prejudice. It will have to be for the Commonwealth immigration as a whole if we decide. But, Mr. Butler... but for all Butler's liberal concerns, he was at times prepared to play to the gallery. He wasn't above uh, posturing in a kind of macho way to uh, appeal to more right-wing conservatives. And I remember him coming to one of the party committee meetings and uh, saying, which made me slightly shudder, they tell me that uh, we've only got 1% of the population who's black, but it looks an awful lot more, he said. The bill that Butler prepared forced politicians on all sides to wrestle with their consciences. The third session of the 42nd Parliament of the United Kingdom and Northern Ireland is now underway. The government's plans have been announced and are being debated. It was very dramatic. It was one of the great parliamentary occasions of my life. I had actually written a speech for Mr Butler, the Home Secretary, and uh, went down, suffered the agony of hearing a minister giving my own speech. And uh, as the record shows, he was constantly interrupted. Uh, there were uh, obviously a great deal of feeling about it. And we knew we were in for serious trouble when Mr. Gates call started. He gave a, a, a most Im impassioned oration. I believe with all my heart that the existence of this remarkable multiracial collection, association of independent nations stretching across five continents covering every race is something that is potentially of immense value to the world. Hugh Gatesgill in some ways stood as a bulwark against racism. For him, anti-racism was a kind of uh, fundamental foundation stone, a talisman, something he couldn't move away from at all. And this led him, I think, to this tremendous opposition to the 62 Act, and in doing that, he set a moral tone for the whole of the Labour Party. I was then uh, a backbencher and uh, listening to Gates School, and 
as a really effective speech in the House of Commons does, you know, it made one ashamed to be uh, uh, sitting on <laughs> the side of the house that you were. The government's plans to discriminate between British subjects provoked fury, not just among student demonstrators, but also among some senior conservatives. I remember Red Butler being marched up and down the corridors of the House of Commons by Alan Lennox Boyd, who was then the uh, in colonial secretary, telling him, as it were, what misery this would cause to the inhabitants of Antigua or, 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 or Barbados or something. And uh, I remarked later that they hadn't got any votes and the people in this country had. But Britain was also the destination of 50,000 Irish immigrants each year who came in search of work. Their entry was uncontrolled, revealing that the government was restricting immigration on grounds of colour. At the time, it did seem to an awful lot of people that it was indefensible that you should be uh, uh, savagely restricting the intake of uh, Commonwealth citizens from Jamaica and from India and from Pakistan while you were allowing completely free access uh, to area which wasn't even uh, a member of the Commonwealth. It fell to my colleague and me to explain the difficulties of making any sort of concession on, on this point. We pointed out, for example, the difficulties of policing the border between Southern Ireland and uh, Northern Ireland, a subject which wasn't quite as familiar then as it's unfortunately become since. In fact, Rab Butler went beyond allowing Irish immigration to continue. Behind the scenes, he was seeking Ireland's help in reducing Commonwealth immigration to Britain. Long before the bill was prepared, I, he sent me to Northern Ireland and I had discussions there. But I, I'm not going to go into those discussions, obviously. A lot of such things are state secret, you know. The uh, arrangements made with the Irish uh, Republic were in effect for them to exercise uh, immigration controls uh, over immigrants coming from overseas. Otherwise, I mean, it will be only too easy to come into Southern Ireland, then go into Northern Ireland, and then simply into the Great Britain. London Airport, the 1st of July, 1962. An historic day for the Commonwealth as the first of its citizens arrive who do not automatically have free entry into the United Kingdom. An act variously described as shabby, tragic or distasteful but necessary comes into force and Commonwealth citizens queue with aliens. The doors were closing. The British Immigration Service could now determine the fate of British subjects from Commonwealth countries. The fact that I might be influencing for good or ill the lives of other people was to me just one of those things. It didn't cost me any sleepless nights. Somebody has to do the kind of job and I was quite happy to do it. The rules still allowed the immigrants' families to come and join them and some members of the British establishment wanted tougher controls. There was a great deal of rather sentimental and quite mistaken view that you couldn't possibly part them from their families. And so their families were allowed to come too, which is quite unnecessary. Immigrants and their families continued to settle in the inner cities. This led to tensions, particularly in the West Midlands. Smerik, uh, a black country town, suddenly had deposited upon it a very large number of immigrants, coloured immigrants. Uh, there was intense feeling against them. They're a nuisance when you've got to walk past them in the streets, they won't move. They're a nuisance at work, they won't work. And uh, for folks who got them living by them, they're a new, more nuisance still. I've got to bring this little boy up uh, amongst them. And um, they're not clean, 
and the smell of the cooking makes you feel sick. What are you doing positive in Smethwick to help coloured people? You seem to have no answer, sir. Well... <laughs> The Conservative candidate for the 64 election was Peter Griffiths. He hoped to unseat the Shadow Foreign Secretary, Patrick Gordon Walker. I remember very little about the campaign except the slogan. Uh, the slogan which Mr Griffiths, I think, said he didn't use, but certainly other people used, if you want a nigger for a neighbour, vote Labour. I remember travelling on the Midland bus from Hansburg to Smedic. The slogans was all over the place. The, the walls were daubed with black paint. If you want a nigger for a neighbour, vote Labour. It really pained me in the stomach. I was gutted, really. We didn't believe that it would be a potent enough weapon to defeat the potential foreign secretary. And I remember doing a big rally with Patrick Gordon Walker when Harold Wilson came and we all said, are oh, you going to be all right, Patrick? And Patrick had no doubt that he was going to hold it because he believed that the innate decency of the electorate would see him through. I had the constituency next door called All Saints, uh, where exactly the same problem existed. All Saints Labour Party. But Patrick and I took quite different views on how to cope with it. Patrick and I uh, addressed a factory gate meeting and uh, he said, in effect, not quite as baldly as this, but he said in effect that it was all the fault of the Tory government anyway who had let all these immigrants in. Uh, I was furious with him. If you're a person who is worried on the race issue, why vote for Patrick Gordon Walker when you can vote for Peter Griffiths? and have the full Monte. Gordon Walker, Patrick, Christian. Labour. 14,916. Griffiths, Peter, Harry, Steve. Conservative. 16,000. 16,690. The overwhelming memory I have of Smedic is election night and horror that having lost. Horror because I like Patrick, horror because we'd lost a safe Labour seat, but horror that this had become a force in British politics. It was there now to be counted. I suffered utter disillusionment when I saw that. I thought, oh God, I was so wrong in, in my own thinking about Britain. When I went to work, I was working in the factory at the time, I, I could look at my mates, people that I normally would talk to, share a cup of tea with. I, I couldn't do it. The Smethic Conservatives danced long into the night to celebrate Griffith's victory. We shall say that Smethic was a beacon of hope because it made up its own mind on the issues and chose regardless of gratuitous advice from outside. Yeah. Harold Wilson is the new Prime Minister, though with almost the tiniest possible majority. I was standing at the bar of the House. I suppose I've been a member of Parliament less than a week. And Harold Wilson said this thing, destined to spend his time here as a parliamentary leper. And it was just a gasp of astonishment all around the house. People felt let down and very annoyed. And they were afraid it showed itself in their attitude towards him personally. Despite the tag of parliamentary leper, Griffiths was an MP for 20 years. After Smethwick, he represented Portsmouth from 1979 to 1997. Peter Griffiths was a scandal to the House of Commons. Whatever he believed, he'd no, uh, it was no justification for the way he tried to play on the lowest common denominator of people's emotions. Electoral considerations of the kind that uh, revealed themselves in such a very ugly way in Smethwick, it did affect uh, the, the attitude of the general body of Labour politicians uh, to, to what they had to do to, to tackle the, the problem of immigration and race relations. The tragedy was uh, that once in office, Labour panicked and indeed far from repealing the Commonwealth Immigration Act, uh, 
uh, we produced a white paper proposing to toughen it up a bit. But, you know, if the, um, if the electorate is saying, control them, control them, you have to listen. The uh, consensus certainly go up between the two front benches. Not a terribly friendly consensus. A marriage of necessity rather than of convenience, or perhaps of convenience as well, but not really from the heart. Labour operated uh, very many of the same controls that the Tories had done, though the Tories were always ducking them for not having done enough, as they could put it. Um, but um, the, Labour did it, if you like, out of political cowardice, not political conviction. <laughs> Having done a U-turn on immigration, Labour tried to switch the focus of attention to relations between the races. Can you stop the machine? Investigations had already begun to reveal that discrimination on the basis of colour was rife. When I worked for Panorama, we undertook uh, one investigation uh, into uh, the colour bar on the railways because uh, it was absolutely clear that um, the railways were not uh, employing black people. It's much harder for a West Indian to get a job in Britain today than it was a year ago. But how much of the trouble is due to colour prejudice? Is there any colour bar on British railways? No, there is no colour bar on British railways. I went down to uh, the station master at a big London uh, station. This is Mr Davis, the goods agent in charge of Smithfield Depot. How many vacancies have you at the moment? Uh, it's nine vacancies for staff at the moment. Next day at Lambeth, I met four unemployed Jamaican. They had been looking for work for weeks. They weren't skilled, but they could read and write, and as far as I could judge, they were intelligent and had good records. So I suggested that they should go to Smithfield to ask for the jobs which the manager had said were vacant. They went there on Thursday morning. They were turned down. I went straight back to Mr. Davis for another interview. Now, Mr. Davis, you have vacancies here. Oh, yes. But now, four coloured men came this morning to ask for jobs and they were turned away. Why was that? I see. It was denied that there was any discrimination, but the plain fact was that uh, the unions uh, didn't want it and uh, management went along with it. Now, why is it that there is a prejudice here against coloured men? Oh, there's no prejudice, Mr Chair, why? But no official information existed about the extent of racial discrimination in Britain. The government set up a small unit to go around the country to all the local authority areas which had large numbers of immigrants. We also made a point of visiting um, major employers. They were quite happy to employ uh, coloured people, uh, providing they weren't visible. Um, in other words, if they worked in the kitchens, um, that was all right. But um, employers felt that um, Shoppers wouldn't like to see coloured hands handling food over the counter. Uh, they thought that ladies wouldn't be happy to buy their underwear from uh, coloured girls. To get black people in shops, we actually had to get the um, cooperation of one of the key persons in the Oxford and Regent Street Traders Association and this person said to me if you can find me and I want you to listen carefully for pretty black girls pretty in quotation marks um, I will employ them and then my colleagues will follow one minister who had personal experience of the extent of racial prejudice was Barbara Castle as Overseas Development Minister, she entertained Commonwealth politicians, including Malawi's Hastings Banda. He was my least favourite Commonwealth Prime Minister. 
Uh, he um, he was running a dictatorship in Malawi. He was uh, sidling up to South Africa. He was disliked and loathed by other Africans, and he certainly was by me. But he uh, seized his opportunity to draw up to him and uh, put his cheek against mine and uh, show us apparently canoodling. Well, I was very angry because uh, he'd no right to do that. But, of course, the, the Express seized the opportunity and there was this enormous picture the next day on the Express showing this embrace. And I received the filthiest and most racist uh, letters I'd ever received following that. I mean, with... The people had cut out the, the express photo. One wrote across it, disgusting. Another said, nigger lover. And one letter said, if these kind of things can take place in public, heaven knows what goes on behind the scenes. <laughs> Roy Jenkins, the new Home Secretary, came to the job determined to legislate against discrimination. I had a sort of agenda, a liberal agenda, if you like, which I had set out in a little Penguin special, which I had written for the 1959 election. It had a final chapter called, Is Britain Civilised? And I set out a number of things which I thought would make this country more civilised. Race relations was certainly there, and in a sense it was a very important one. Anyway. However, the police were far from delighted by Roy Jenkins' liberal agenda. One of the most difficult meetings I've ever done in my life was a thing called the Metropolitan Police Boards. Had a sort of day out. They all turned up in Westminster Central Hall for what I sometimes a sort of bacchanalia in the evening. And they, they were objecting to a lot of liberal things which had gone through. They didn't like the end of capital punishment. They didn't like the end of flogging. Um, but the one thing which really got them excited was when I said there is no doubt that we have to contemplate having a substantial uh, black or coloured element within the police force. And they screamed for about two minutes then. I've never forgotten that. Mr. Callaghan has resigned as Chancellor of the Exchequer because he had to change his mind over devaluation. Mr. Jenkins, the Home Secretary, becomes Chancellor, and Mr. Callaghan takes over Mr. Jenkins' job at the Home Office. I'm very sorry in many ways to be leaving the Home Office, but I've greatly enjoyed the past two years. With James Callaghan's arrival as Home Secretary, arguments over the Race Relations Bill intensified. The question arose as to whether it should apply to the Crown, that meant to the public services. And I had been briefed by my security officer, the Ministry of Technology, that you couldn't. Because he said, um, uh, the actual phrase he used, and I wrote it in my diary, was, uh, security is based on loyalty, loyalty is based on nationality, nationality precludes foreigners, and any foreigner who is coloured, even if he comes from the Commonwealth, will feel he has been adversely treated. Now, what he was really saying was that the only true loyalty is a white Briton. If we were going to have a Race Relations Act, it was important for it to cover all aspects of public life where black people were in active contact with people. So it needed to cover employment, housing, credit facilities, and the police. This is the latest section information there. You'll notice when looking at this that we're getting quite a lot of stolen motorcycles. So I want you to keep your... James Callaghan, the new Home Secretary, was more understanding of police hostility towards the Race Relations Bill. He wanted to exclude the, the police from the operation of the bill. I'm not sure he did to begin with, but I think he was under great pressure from the police, the police to do so and brought this to the cabinet. I was unfortunately away. I was in Rome, probably trying to borrow some money, which is what Chancellor of the Exchequer were mostly doing in those days. And um, so I submitted a formal memorandum of, um, of dissent from this, which the Prime Minister read out and put in the cabinet minutes. Um, but the absent are always wrong, so I didn't carry it. <laughs> 
I think it would be difficult for James Callaghan not to exclude the police because some of his key advisors were the police themselves. He was sponsored by the Police Federation and therefore it would have been very difficult for him not to take their advice. That was a mistake. We should have insisted on the police being in there at that time. Uh, but there were very strong representations and we gave way on it. I regret that we did. We should have insisted on it. This mistake has never been corrected. Police law enforcement continues to be exempt from race discrimination law. The present government has pledged to change this since the death of Stephen Lawrence. But a more immediate problem faced the government on immigration. In Kenya, Jomo Kenyatta's drive to Africanize his country created a crisis for British subjects living there. Towards the end of 1967, the heat was turned on the Asian community. Many Asians had retained British citizenship under the terms of the independence agreement. Kenyatta made them choose between becoming Kenya citizens or risk losing their jobs and trades. When many Asians chose to come to Britain, certain politicians on the right immediately raised the alarm. We are determined to preserve the British character of Britain. We welcome other races in reasonable numbers, but we have already admitted more than we can absorb. The British government made a last-ditch attempt to persuade India to take the unwanted Kenyan Asians. A delegation was sent to Delhi. This was in order to explore through the High Commission there with the Indian government whether they would be receptive to the idea of some of these Indian people uh, going back to India. Uh, going back is the wrong way of describing it because most of them had never been in India but they were Indian in origin and they had a stronger connection with India as they did with the United Kingdom. But uh, the Indian government, I think, with hindsight, quite understandably, felt that these were people who'd cast their lot in with Africa and thereby with the United Kingdom, and that was where they should go. This is a scene that's occurring almost every night at Nairobi Airport. Nearly a thousand people a week, perhaps more than a thousand a week, are now leaving Kenya for Britain. This is the Asian community, a community of which still about 125,000 people are entitled as British citizens to come to Britain. But that entitlement was soon to be downgraded. Those Asians who hadn't set off for Britain were about to have their right to automatic entry dramatically and abruptly removed. In the last week of February 1968, Callaghan rushed through legislation that would keep the Asians out. I remember getting home at 7.15 where my husband was asleep in bed. I flopped on the bed and said, Ted, get me a cup of tea. And while he did, I dozed off for three minutes. Then I had to get up, have a bath, some breakfast and go to a cabinet meeting. Well, <laughs> the awful thing was, I, I, th I remember that in that cabinet meeting, I struggled to keep awake. But it was Jim Callaghan droning on as Home Secretary. He just could not stay awake. That haunted me ever for the rest of my cabinet life, the fact that I'd never fallen asleep in cabinet before. And to do it on that bill, I could see my enemies attacking me. She never said a word. This march on Downing Street was one of the first repercussions against the government's plan to curb the entry of Asians from Kenya into Britain. They weren't all Asians who felt strongly opposed to the new policy, which is designed to control the flood of immigrants into a more easily absorbed, steady flow. I thought it was a moral disgrace. Never mind race. It broke a pledge that we had given. Uh, I'm not in favour of uh, governments breaking solemn pledges. Wilson and Callaghan and the others uh, panicked uh, and therefore they brought in this shameful piece of legislation which was clearly racist in the sense that uh, they weren't worried about an influx of uh, white f farmers from the 
Kenyan uh, highlands, uh, purely worried about uh, Asians. And other more senior conservatives were also uneasy. I remember one night sort of walking up and down the lobbies in the House of Commons, agonising as to whether we were right to be prepared to go along with the Callum government, and which was the view of the shadow cabinet as a whole, or whether we ought not to stand out against it. And in the end, rightly or wrongly, we decided to fall in line. There was outcry on the streets, but Labour ministers were still agonising over the right course of action. I thought in principle it was the, the, the wrong thing to do because it uh, flew in the face of our uh, very serious uh, Commonwealth obligations and uh, indeed our uh, international obligations um, I I generally. And uh, therefore, uh, for me as for others, it, it was a very, very painful uh, 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 business in the, the House of Commons at that time. George Thompson was representing the difficulties that would arise I wasn't unaware of the difficulties that were arrived. We all were. We knew very well the difficulties. But there were also uh, 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 problems that we had to face here. Uh, and, uh, and, and we had to balance those problems. Shelley Williams and I spent the entire passage bill together, I was going to say, moaning to each other. What do we do? And we went to see Jim Gallon twice and we talked about resigning. Yet in the space of 72 hours, MPs pushed through a law that turned British passport holders from Kenya into second-class citizens. Thousands of miles away in Nairobi, Kenya's capital, the Asian community prepared to leave. Britain was their destination. But the entry gates were quickly being closed. British passport holder Babu Mehta's application to join his family and pregnant wife in Britain fell the wrong side of February 1968. When I applied for the visa, they, they refused me, said they, you can't join the family until you get your, your turn for the visa. So I had to stay back. Babu Mehta was thrown into prison as an illegal immigrant after he tried to come to Britain anyway, but without the necessary papers. So we were put all together with other criminals. There were two in rooms. We had to do toilet and everything in the room. Eventually, the British authorities sent him back to Nairobi. I went to Nairobi um, shortly after the legislation and I saw the, the queues outside the British High Commission, uh, which, of course, was, was a, a terrible sight for British citizens having to queue in all weathers in the street to try and get um, vouchers. Babu Mehta was one of a group of Kenyan Asians who camped outside the British High Commission as a protest against Britain's refusal to honour their passports. They all had a touching faith that they, we would honour the British passport that they got. And uh, they found they were not being treated as they saw it fairly. And so they came and... Uh, in many cases, were camped outside my immigration office. And it was a very demeaning situation. The reasons for refusing your application, which we are not prepared to discuss, reiterated that an entry certificate cannot be issued, and therefore I refuse your application. The matter is out of our hands. Increasingly concerned about his wife's health, Babu Mehta wrote to the wife of one of the British officials, pleading with her to intervene with her husband. The High Commission deemed the letter offensive. Mater decided to fly to London, even though he still didn't have the right entry certificate. We went to Uganda. And from Uganda, they sent us back again to Nairobi. And uh, this time, the Kenyan government didn't accept us. They sent us back to Entebbe. Entebbe, they sent us back to Addis Ababa. And from Addis Ababa, we went back to England. And from England, they sent us back to Kenya. Again from Kenya, they didn't expect us, so, so they sent us back to London. Again, they sent us from London to Nairobi. And the last time, they sent us back from Nairobi to London. <laughs> 
and this time they accepted us. Like Babu Mehta, British Asians from Kenya who wanted to come to Britain were often forced to wait, sometimes for years, just as the act had intended. I can only say uh, that for me it was a trauma for the 36 hours. I should have resigned over the bill. Uh, I voted for a lot of things that have a Commons I shouldn't have voted for. But that's what political life is like. There's only one I should have been so opposed to that I resigned, and it was that. Some campaigners claimed that Babu Mehta would have been able to join his wife more easily if the Home Secretary had been Roy Jenkins. I can't say for certain whether I would have um, introduced the bill. I'd have been very loath to do so. I was trying to grapple with what seemed to most people at the time to be the central thing threatening the life of the government, which was the balanced payments economic situation and the position of Sterling. And I think I would have thought it was a little light-hearted to, to run away from that on a resignation of principle on, um, on, uh, on, on, on the Kenyan nation's bill, which indeed I had allowed to be prepared by officials. I, I think I said, go slow, try and avoid doing it, I don't like it, etc. But I didn't say more than that. The Right Honourable Enoch Powell. The Right Honourable Enoch Powell, MBE, MP. But a figure was emerging who would threaten the political consensus, the Conservative Shadow Defence Secretary. Why are the British hagridden and bullied from year to year? <coughs> bullied and badgered? and despised and impoverished. To contain him, Powell was put on the committee hammering out the Tory party's line on the race relations bill then before Parliament. As far as we knew, Enoch agreed with us, although he practically never contributed to discussions of that kind. He was a silent member. I don't, can't remember he was absolutely silent, but basically he was silent. But Powell did break his silence on the 20th of April, 1968, in a speech at the Midland Hotel, Birmingham. The discrimination and the deprivation, the sense of alarm and of resentment lie not with the immigrant population, but with those among whom they have come and are still coming. This is why to enact legislation of the kind before Parliament at this moment is to risk throwing a match onto gunpowder. I was at my home at Broadstairs on the coast that Saturday evening. when the phone started ringing vigorously from every press correspondent saying what my comments about Powell's speech. And I had to say, well, I haven't seen it. He's not given us any notice of it. Uh, Mr Heath phoned me up and he told me what he was proposing to do, which was to ask Mr Powell to leave the shadow cabinet. I remember Ted ringing me up on Sunday morning because it was all over the Sunday papers, saying Enoch must go. And I said, look, I really, I would just wait and just read the whole speech and just uh, think about it for a few days. No, no, he must go. Everyone says he must go. I s remember saying to him, well, I wouldn't have threatened you, but now you've said that, I'm bound to tell you that if you hadn't done that, I should have resigned. And I gather I was not the only one who took that view. They gathered in my flat in London and we discussed it all. And everyone was absolutely agreed that he must go. That was the end of any possibility of working with Enoch Powell as a political colleague. Frankly, we felt we could no longer trust him. Uh, if I tried to stand by him, as, as one particular person has said we ought to have done at that time, she now said it, she didn't say it, in my knowledge at the time, uh, then, of course, uh, I wouldn't have had a shadow cabinet left. I thought it was a conclusion jumped to far too rapidly if you looked at the logic and reason in his speech. I then asked... Uh, Willie Whitelaw, who was the chief whip of the opposition, to uh, get Enoch on the phone. So he came back and said um, Enoch, as far as he could find out, was in Wolverhampton and he hadn't got a telephone. So I then said, well, they get hold of his agent in the constituency and get the agent to bring him to a telephone. 
Well, that was finally arranged. And I then said, I'm afraid that his colleagues just couldn't accept this speech. And there was no alternative for, but for him to go. And he said very well and went. When you hear some skinhead lout shouting it outside a public house at closing time, that's bad enough. But when it comes from a man in pinstripe trousers and a Homburg hat, who's been a professor of Greek and a brigadier in the British Army and a Tory cabinet minister, somehow it gives it an air of respectability. And that was what was so wicked. Heath, to sack him, was taking a very bold move, which very large numbers of active Conservative supporters uh, profoundly disagreed with. And if he hadn't done it, uh, I do think there's a chance that the course of British politics and uh, the place that uh, racism uh, might have played in, in British politics would have been very different from what it has been. Well, it was one contribution which I made, yes. But I wouldn't say it was the most important. Uh, in its own sphere, it was important, yes. The Dockers marched in support as Enoch Powell's speech echoed across the country. Emboldened, Powell was to cast himself as a prophet in the political wilderness. His sermons were to challenge the fragile consensus on race for years to come. And the series continues next week at the later time of 8 o'clock. Will you solemnly promise and 